Okay. So just for the sake of recording, these are the things that we're going to go through today. We'll learn about generics uh, classes and generic methods. Generics are some of the heavily used uh, components in Spring Boot application. And then we'll go through collections, list and array list. These again are some of the heavily used uh, collections. Uh, we'll also go through set, hash set and tree set, which are part of collection. These are also used and map, which is the most used uh, data structure in any Java based application. Okay, so we'll go through all of these things. What is the idea behind this thing? It, it is not to teach you in depth about each of them. It's just to introduce you to these data structures and uh, get you familiar with how these things work so that when you actually start working on Spring Boot application, it becomes easier. Okay, so we'll start with generics. All right. Um, so before I uh, start about generics, let me show you why generics was needed. Okay, so let me create a new project here. We'll do the basic things here. Uh, 1.8 is my Java base. Everything is fine here. And again, I'm using IntelliJ. Uh, next, next, and here what I'm going to do is I'll call it. Uh, I think they're already. Give me a second. I'll have to get rid of this. Nothing here. Cool. All uh, right. Okay. <clears throat> so let's uh, let's say that you have you are trying to build a library, okay, or maybe some utility class. Imagine this. What is the job of the utility class? The job of the utility class is that it is just going to print the object. Okay, let's see how we would do in in a typical uh, you know um, Java application. Let's say I want to print a string, so I'll basically create a class called print. Okay, string. All right, and I'll have a method here: public void print. Okay string string okay and what this method will do is it will just print it uh, printing okay uh, okay this is a simple method uh, nothing difficult about this we can call we can create a main class or driver class whatever you want okay what do we usually do we say uh, print string okay right and let's say blah blah okay simple thing run this application So your output is printing blah blah. Now let's say you have to. There's another requirement that says we need to create the same functionality for integers. Okay, what we'll do with the current setup is we'll create a print integer. This thing will basically copy paste the whole line of code here. Okay, uh, and this will take an integer. This will take. You, I'm just going to refactor this. Right click, refactor, rename, integer. Uh -uh. Continue editing. All right, cool. So that creates our uh, print integer. Okay. We'll do this pi. Simple thing. There's nothing very fancy about this. Print. Uh, and this will just take an integer, let's say two and two, three. Okay. Run this thing. Okay. Now there is another requirement that says that we will now have to do the same thing for float. Uh, someone else says we'll now have to do the same thing for, let's say, some other type of data type. Okay. You cannot go ahead creating a class for every type of uh, data type that you have, right? So you have to create something which serves the same functionality 
but it works on every kind of object okay let me repeat that again you provide a functionality which does exactly one thing or it can do multiple things but it you create it in such a way that it applies to all the data types okay so one way of doing this is basically creating a class called print object okay have the method here print and just pass the object here uh, let's say obj pj okay this is it right so we can do this and be done with this because everything that you create in java will be a parent of object okay um, so the question now is uh, what if you need to do something else let's say inside this uh, functionality uh, you basically have a requirement where you say that if it is a string then print something if it is something else then uh, like if it's a number then add 10 to it based on different uh, like different data structures or different data types you will have to create different functionalities right this becomes tedious for that okay sometimes you may have a requirement which says that uh, create a functionality like this which applies only to a set of uh, data types for example everything that comes under numbers okay that takes integer uh, float double okay if you have a requirement like this okay that create something that only works with integer float and double then your object won't work because if you create this method and pass a string to it it'll do the same thing okay so we had a problem here okay where for every type of data type and to provide the same functionality we had to go ahead and create different classes right so in order for us to solve that we created something called print object okay which is going to take any kind of object so what what we were doing here was we were doing something very specific for a particular data type here we expanded the scope we if you are familiar with javascope you would know this object basically is the mother of everything right so the expand the scope here is widened completely so you, anybody can use this method but if we have a requirement where we have to work with something very specific like this like only that particular data type that we have to work with uh, huh. so he mother ali said that it's the overloading yes we can also do overloading but then there would be a problem because you at the end of the day will have either an object or a concrete data type you can either have a string here or you can have uh, integer here or you can have float here uh, or you have object here if you wanted to apply to just these three things here how will you do that any idea mother okay cool uh all right so this is where generics come in okay generics are basically something which says that you can either achieve this or you can also achieve this okay i'll show you both the things okay so uh first i'll go ahead and create uh, basically generic classes okay so how do we write a particular generic method let's go ahead and create a package here called generics okay Generics. If you have any problems understanding, just stop me and I'll explain again. Okay. So, how do we write a generic class? I'm going to uh, write something, right? Uh, I'm going to create a class called print. Okay. That's it. Now, in the print, you can. So, typically in a generic class, after the class, you have to give this angle brackets. Okay these two angle brackets when you give these two angle brackets the java compiler immediately recognizes that okay this is something that is going to apply to probably everyone or just a set of things okay this angle brackets and then you basically pass a particular uh, variable okay uh, 
whose data type is going to be determined at runtime. What do I mean by that? Okay. So I've given here angle bracket here and I passed T here. Okay. So print T. At this point, your Java compiler does not know what this T represents. It can represent an object. I mean, it can represent an integer. It can represent a string. But with this here, you're telling the compiler that decide the data type of T at runtime. Okay. Now what I'll do is I'll create uh, the same print method here, public void print. Okay. I'll say T data. What I'll do here is printing data. Okay. This is it. Let's see how this works. I'll come to the main method again. I'll get rid of all of these things. I'll create a print class here. Okay. Now in this angle bracket here, it says T extends object. You see here that I have not given anything here, right? I have not written anything. So automatically, if you do not give anything after T, it, it takes it as extending object. Okay. In fact, let me show you something funny here. I'm not sure if you have ever seen this thing, but I told you, right, that every class that you create is basically a child of object. If you write this extends object here, you will see IntelliJ giving you a warning here. Okay. And if you look at this warning here, it will say remove redundant extends object, which means that if you just write the class, the Java compiler at runtime will automatically add this extends object part. Okay. Similarly, if you just write T here, Java compiler will automatically implement this for you extends object. Okay. I'm not sure if this will, uh, like if you can get this much information on Eclipse, but if you're using IntelliJ, it will give you a lot of stuff like this. Okay. Okay. So now I have the requirement that I want to print a string. So I'll say, create this class for string type. Okay. You'll say P one, that is our printer one new print. Okay. Done. Uh, so if you're using, um, yeah, if you're using Java eight, then you don't have to write this string again, because that becomes redundant here. So we'll just follow this principle. You write it only at once at this point, and then you write, uh, you leave this blank here. Okay. So if you see here, the declaration, this, and this, they're different. How are they different? This print string is a concrete class. Okay. This one is also a concrete class, but the data that it deals with is actually hard coded, like hardly defined here. It is only for string here. When you go here, you'll see that this method can accept only string here. When you come here, you're creating a class just for string, which means that if you say uh, p one dot print, okay, and you pass this thing, it'll print that. Okay. If you want the same thing for uh, integer, you don't have to create another print integer class. You can reuse the same class. Okay. I'm not saying you can reuse the same P one object. I'm saying you can reuse the same class here. So print, I will say integer. Okay. I'll say P two new print print. And I'll just pass some number here and you can see it's the same method that I'm calling here with a different, uh, argument, which is an integer argument, and it still works. So what is happening here? If I passed, if instead of like, if I do this, instead of one, two, three, if I wrap this inside a string, this method will immediately give me an error. Why? Because inside this method, it is taking a very hard data type. Like it's already defined. You cannot take anything more than integer. But if you come to this class, the compiler at this point does not know what type of data it will be, right? Because it's a T data type. It's an, it extends object, so it can work with anything. Right. So that's why it doesn't complain. But then when you're creating that class at that time, you're defining this as integer, which means at the runtime, at the runtime, your compiler is deciding, okay, so this is an integer class. So when the compiler is executing this method, it is basically converting this T into an integer. So what you see here at the runtime, this is what this becomes. Any questions here so far? Anybody wants me to repeat? I'll repeat again.
क्विक रिविजन राइट अच्छा ठीक है लेट सी वॉट वी डिड हियर we had a <clears throat> we had to create a functionality like a single class with one function where we had to print the object right initially if you don't know about generics what you would do is you would create something like print string okay uh this will be a method which will be taking a hardly defined uh data type like this is defined to be string you cannot pass any other object to it okay then if you wanted to do the same functionality for an integer you would either create another method called print integer or something okay but that's not that's not a good practice so what you'll do is you'll go ahead and create one more class called here uh, print integer okay where you will just pass integer then tomorrow if you have to pass like if you have to do the same thing for float then you would create one more print method with where you will be passing the float uh, value Did you understand what we are doing here? Yes, sir. We okay. are hard coding the data type. Yes. So basically, the same method. If you want to apply for a particular data type, you have to go ahead and create class for every data type we have here. So in order to avoid that, we created print object. Okay, print object. We passed object here. This will accept anything. This will accept an integer. This will accept a string and all that stuff. So this will work. Like. if we go ahead and come here and we say uh let's say print object po new print object right and then we say po dot print we pass 1 2 3 here this will also work if we pass let's say a string here that will also work okay so this method will be fine when you're just dealing with object but there is a problem what if you have a requirement where you say that the same functionality will be applicable only for certain data types like in our example it should be applicable only for int float and double if you write this method here at this object there are many ways you can handle it you can say if uh this obj is an instance of integer right then do something if it is uh let's say obj instance of uh let's say double uh, float okay if it is float then do something and similarly you will have another if else case uh but yeah so let's say obj instance of double okay so if your data type that you're passing uh if it is this then do that otherwise what will you do you will either ignore it or you will just throw an exception here to stop the execution of the flow okay you'll throw probably a runtime exception or something okay but this is not right because tomorrow if your scope increases like if instead of uh int float and double you also have to include string okay then you'll have to come here and add one more else if block okay you have to add one more else if block and like this if you have now these are just the data types that already come right what if you create your own class you create your own class and you have like let's say 500 such java classes you cannot write 500 if else cases here right and you cannot and this is just in one method what if you have let's say 10 methods like this print a print b print c print c you will have to write those 500 if else three times if you have three methods 10 times if you have 10 methods that's not at all possible and it's not a logical thing to do so in order for us to do that we ha have to introduce the concept of generics do you understand the problem with this approach hello yes, sir right okay so now you have to do something with generics uh, let me just remove this get rid of that okay all right so what did we do here we created a simple print function here i mean sorry print class here okay and what we said here is in this class we introduced this angle brackets okay and here we passed for now just one data type t t here means the type of data right you can it can be anything you can give t you can give k you can give l you can give anything you want okay so the industry mostly uses t for a particular type of data k for key v for val as in value and stuff like that okay 
So uh, I'll just use T here. And then I'm basically creating this print function and I'm passing the T here. So from this methods point of view, it doesn't know what type of data it will be. Okay. But what it does know is that no matter what you create, sorry, one second. What you create here, what you pass here will always be extending an object. Okay. So the compiler here is not able to determine the exact data type, but it knows that it will be something uh, a, which is a child of an object. Okay. When you create your class like this, and then you run your program at the runtime, whatever this thing is, whatever this print function is, right? This print function here will then be converted to this function. Okay. Let me copy this for you and paste it here so that you understand this. Okay. When at the runtime, when you run this function, right? Whatever you see here. Hello. Yeah. Who's this question? Ashish Kumar. No, sir. Okay, cool. All right. So what happens is at runtime, this function will become this. Okay. Similarly at runtime, this function for integer will become this. Is this clear for everyone? What generic is doing? If you have any questions or if you want to again, no. no more questions, right? Cool. So you have, who's this? Uh, yeah, this is Vishwesh, sir. Yeah, yeah, hi. Hi, sir. Uh, sir, I'm really sorry. Due to my work, I joined uh, 15 minutes late. Uh, gotcha. Can you brief it? Okay, uh, okay. I'll uh, I'll go like uh, quickly over this thing. Okay. So imagine you have a task. Okay. What is that task? Create a print function for string. Okay. This is your task. What you will do is you'll create a you're something called print string class and you'll have a print function here. Okay. You will pass the string here and then you'll do a system.out.println and you'll print your uh, this thing here. Uh, that's done. Problem solved. But tomorrow you have a requirement which says that now along with string, you have to do it for integer as well. Okay. So you'll go ahead and you'll create uh, because you need to have separate uh, functionalities, right? You'll create a print integer class, which will have a print method. And then you'll have your integer here. Okay. Uh, even if you go with the approach of, let's say, um, creating an interface, let's say I introduce, uh, an interface here. Okay. Interface, oh, sorry, not this print. I, okay. This is my interface. Let's say I'm trying to say that I'm going to do uh, method overloading, right? So I'll say, uh, void print. But what will be the data type here? You don't know, right? Because if you give it string, then you cannot use the same interface for integer, right? If you give it integer, then you cannot use it for anything else, right? So having this interface also wouldn't work, right? So what in order for us to solve that problem, what we did was we created print object. Okay. Print object. You will have a function called print. It will have an object. And basically because everything, every class in Java is basically a child of object. This will work for everything. Okay. Problem solved. But if you have a requirement where you say that you need to have this print functionality only for int float and double, right? In that case, this object will work even for string. This object will work even for, let's say something else, right? You don't want that. So there we have a problem because I, I was solving the earlier problem with just having to pass just object here. But now if I need to narrow down my options, right? I have no way I can, I can put here three if else blocks to basically, uh, I can put if, and then else if, okay. What am I doing here? Yeah, I, I can do these things. Okay. Tomorrow, if uh, I have one more requirement for, let's say string. Okay. I'll have to add one more else if here. Okay. That's not at all expected. And that's not the logical way to do it. Okay. So you recognize that we have a problem here to solve this problem. We, uh, 
Java introduced uh, the concept of generics. Okay, what is generics? Generics is basically something whose data type is not determined at the uh, at the compile time. As in, when you're writing code, the compiler does not know what type of data it will be. But when you run the program, it is at runtime that the compiler will decide what type of data it is. Okay, so. This is how you write a generic class. Normal classes, you can see that you have public class print integer, okay? But for generic classes, you have to add this angle brackets, okay? In this angle bracket, you have to basically see how many types of uh, like undefined data you're dealing with. For now, I'm just using one. So I'm putting T here, okay? Then what I'm doing is, let me get rid of this. Okay, then I'm basically creating this public void print where I'm passing this T as the data type and I'm doing this thing. So whatever I have done here for object, integer and string, I'm wrapping all of that in one th single thing here and I'm defining this as T data, okay? What happens at this point is the compiler at this point does not know what the type of data is. When you actually call your class, let me comment these things out, okay? When you actually create this class here for, uh, let's say you're, you, you want this functionality for string. So you say print and you pass the type of data here, string and uh, P1 and then print. And then you basically uh, print this thing. And you can see here that in this method, print method, okay, this accepts a string. If I do one, two, three here, it will throw a problem. So what we were seeing here, right? We had to create two different classes for two different data types here. Here, using generics, we reduce the number of code. We reduce the number of classes we had to create. We now have one class that, in, that can be reused again and again. So this I used here for string. This I used here for integer. Tomorrow, if, you, if I have to use it for, let's say, float, right? Let's say P3. I can do that also, OK? So one class, and this can apply to everything. Now, remember how I told you that uh, this particular method here that I wrote is actually equal to the print object because it is actually taking everything. Okay, uh, it took, um, where is it? Yeah, it took a string, it took a print, and it took a float. But let's say I just want it for numbers, right? So what I'll do here is I'll go to float here, and I can see that float here extends number. Similarly, if you go to integer here, integer also extends number here. Okay, and in fact, if you go here, you can say that uh, anything that's number, it will apply to this. So how do we, so what is this? This is actually narrowing down my options, okay? So I'll make a small change here, okay? Right now you understand, right? This, this particular uh, generic class that I have created, it applies for every, uh, every class that is there. Okay, this apply. This, so this method here is actually equal to writing this print object function, okay? Now we'll see how we can narrow this down, okay? In order for us to narrow down, we just have to say T extends number, okay? When you write this thing, you can see here, these two things work just fine, but this one gives a problem. And it is a problem that is com that is coming from the compiler itself. Like compiler here is not allowing you to do that. If you hover over the, er uh, the error here, it will say type parameter Java lang string is not within its bound, should extend Java lang number. What is it saying? It's saying that this class is a generic class, but it is applicable for only a set of types. Which are those set of types? They are of number types. So, T extends number when you add it here. Anything that is that is extending a number, be it integer, float, double, atomic integer, and all that stuff, it will work only for that, but it won't work for string. Any questions so far? I'm not sure. Got it. Got it, right? Cool. So, this is how we can narrow it down. Now, let's say. And, sir, uh, by default, it's extending the object. Right, ah, sir? Correct, correct. By default, it's extending the object. So if you write something like this, where you don't have, like, for example, if I remove this, right? If I remove this and I come back here, and if I do control P on this, you can see it says T extends object, right? Because I don't have anything here. 
right? So it automatically inserts this for you, okay? If you look over here, it says that remove redundant extends object. But if you want to narrow it down, like I want to narrow it only for numbers. I want it only for numbers here, okay? Then when you come here and do control P, it will tell you, sorry, T extends number. So now I have narrowed it down, okay? So if you have to work with generics, you would use generics only when you have a certain type of data to deal with okay you can also create uh, you know something like this actually in the industry even if you have a method which will apply to every object you would never write something like this okay you would not write something like this you would much rather prefer something like this okay this is how we this is what we follow in the industry basically you will still find some old code bases that have something like this written but ever since generic came people usually don't use this stuff they would write something like this okay cool uh no questions here so this is our generic classes uh i am dealing with one data here uh let's do something different okay um actually yeah i'll show you how i can use multiple data here okay i'll say public void um um okay say something okay uh what i'm gonna do is okay mm, data This time I'll use print F, okay, instead of print ln. I'll say printing one and all right, and I'll just pass. Let's say, uh, yeah, I mean I can pass. Actually, yeah, this it'll just be one. Printing other one. I'll pass the data here, okay. Cool. Uh, if we do this thing, this will obviously throw a problem. It'll say that I don't know what type of data this is. So I can just say string here. I can say string here. I can say, let's say integer here. Okay. Then what will happen is uh, if you call the other function, like let's say, say something, you would have to basically pass your name. So let's say John. Okay. Uh, similarly here, if you say p2 dot say something you can just pass any random data okay so what did i do here i basically took in another variable okay so you can actually have as many number of variables as you want you can take a v here you can take an m here you can take an n here okay this is basically what generics are you can pass a number of uh, types of data here and uh, you can even narrow them down for example you can say that this t will extend only number but k here will extend only string that's it what will happen now is this class will fail okay actually this one will also fail here because this is the only class that will work okay because this is something which is accepting integer and which is uh, the second parameter except string this will work everything else will fail okay uh is there any questions here so far I have shown you how to create a generic class. How uh, to pass. Sir, can we have a method overloading here? Method overloading, yes, you can have. Inside. Yeah, yeah, you because, can. Uh, because uh, you are uh, separating T and K by comma, and mm -hmm. on the other hand, uh, you are uh, putting the restriction of passing two parameters, right? Correct, correct. That is a problem. But uh, I want uh, uh, T to extend number. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. suppose uh, I want to add one more, uh, I mean, uh, primitive data type like string, what we are supposed to achieve. Like basically we extends number mm -hmm. and uh, we wanted uh, our uh, my method to have something uh, regarding the number, but say like in future, if I want to add string to that. Mm -hmm. So how can we achieve sir? String to what? Like uh, basically we have integer float and uh, decimal okay mm -hmm. in one category and if i want to add one more to that category 
सो हाउ कैन वी डील बिकॉज आफ्टर यू हैव रिटर्न टी एक्सटेंड नंबर Uh, so this class is only fixed haan, for haan, number only right ha ha correct correct so i i'll tell you how you can do that okay uh okay. basically if you have something like this anyone that extends your uh, data type right uh, only those will be permitted right now let's say you have um you want to add something else so string here is basically a uh, these are like two incompatible types right so any time you want to uh add more elements to it you have to find the common parent okay string and number the only common parent between these two things is object right so you would be writing object for that but in general uh let me give you an example let's say um i have something like this okay i have an interface and in that interface i'll write um mm, let's say data type okay this is just an interface i create a generic class here and i basically say uh print uh i don't know something okay this is my class here print something here i'll say t extends data type okay and then not private प्रिंट ठीक है टी डेटा ओके टुमोरो व्हेन यू हैव योर कस्टम क्लास टू वर्क विथ ओके यू विल क्रिएट अ क्लास हियर लेट्स से आई हैव डेटा टाइप ए ओके व्हिच विल बेसिकली इंप्लीमेंट डेटा टाइप ओके um what do i need to print here uh yeah so yeah i'll just do a two string here okay if it's confusing for you uh, just hold on for a second i'll tell you what's what i'm trying to do here data type b okay this implements data type okay. and i'll just say to string this to string method by the way is coming from object uh b okay now in my main method i'll get rid of all of these things okay i'll say print something data type a okay print something print something okay and then i would say print something dot print i'll just pass a new data type okay data type done if you run this particular code here you see a okay now let's say tomorrow you introduce a new uh something okay let's say data type c or data type b or a something you will have to you can narrow it down by using an interface basically so if you add another type of data here let's say data type c that has to be a child of this data type okay because when you are writing this print something function you are basically narrowing it down to a particular data type for in my case it is a custom class which is data type so anybody that is a child of data type it will work there okay in this case neither number nor string it will work okay if you want to widen your scope okay hear me out on this if you want to widen your scope you would have to find the common parent okay so number if you uh, talk about string and numbers they the only common parent that they have is basically an object so there you cannot widen the scope okay does, does that answer your question uh, sir i think uh, this is going to be like factory method or factory builder pattern it's looking like factory something method something similar or factory one design pattern is there na sir ah, factory yes, 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 uske jaisa dikh raha hai ye ha 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 so basically factory uh, pattern jo hai na wo basically generics use karta hai ये ये वो वैसा ही दिख रहा है वही है ना सर ये यस एग्जैक्टली दिस इज नॉट फैक्ट्री पैटर्न दिस इज जेनेरिक्स बट आई आई अंडरस्टैंड व्हेयर यू कमिंग फ्रॉम ठीक है एनी क्वेश्चंस
no sir agreed okay. so basically uh, like uh, if you get confused with this thing i think uh, you were confused with one thing here right where was that uh, i i said that if you have number and then int float and this and then you have to extend string here uh, probably that's where your question came like how do i include string here ba basically uh, if you want to widen your scope for this thing let's say the t here is if, when you say it's number anything that is number here will be displayed okay if you wanted to uh, let's say do it for string you would have to change this to an object okay uh that's basically generics this is how you can pass multiple uh parameters uh adding the extends you can basically narrow it down to a particular set of types okay string you know is a final class right so string cannot have its own child so if you just type it as string that's like that's it uh this this is uh basically generic classes i'll show you i'll write one method here to basically show how generic methods work okay generic methods and generic classes are the same thing it's just that the class when you're initializing you're giving the data type there itself in generic methods the class can be a concrete class but the method can be generic let's let me show you how it's done so i'll say i'll have this function called print2 okay now print2 is not going to be a generic class but it will have a generic function okay for us to do that we'll say public and then how many types of data we're going to deal with we're just going to deal with one data okay which is t so we'll say t okay what will it return it will return void because it won't do anything right uh what will it do it will do a print what will it take it will take the data and then you go ahead and say data is then you say data okay that's it if you come to your main method here and uh you say print to print to new print to here i did not my this is a concrete class this is not a generic class but this has a method which is generic if you say print and you pass let's say blah 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 some string here and you basically run this method you will see basically blah 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 here okay if i run uh one two three here okay this will run so so those of you who are currently working in the industry or in a company and if you have you might have come across the class called utility class this is something we'll see uh, when we start to develop spring boot application so there is a concept of utility class and it is basically a single java class with lots of methods there and they're they're just giving you functionalities okay there you will see something like this okay the class itself will not need to be generic but the methods there would be generic they can do lots of function here depending on the type of data you have okay sometimes what can happen is you can also pass this okay tr you, you'll actually see many things like this when you start working with spring boot application this r data type basically what you were defining here right what you were defining here you're doing the same thing here okay for generic methods okay and then uh <clears throat> you pass your t data and what you are going to do is you're just going to have to uh probably uh, return the type of uh, like r here is basically your return so you can say class r R class okay um yeah i mean let me see can we print instance of um sorry this is not how it's done one second um our class instance Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, this this should do. Okay. So if we come back here, what are we doing here? Uh, let's say a teacher. Dot class. You can see that uh, data is one two three is being printed, and then instance of class this thing is integer. Okay. So basically, uh, you can have n number of parameters here. 
and this is where you define what you're going to do and in here like the method argument may or may not use all of them okay uh, but if you are mentioning something let's say i have uh, mentioned tr and then i go ahead and put another this thing here called m and i'm not using it here this is not expected okay so whatever data types you define here make sure you use it there okay uh yep and this class is basically a java class which gives you the type of the class so class and you can see that the class itself is basically generics if you go here into this class you'll see that it actually extends t okay so this class itself is generics where i made it even more generic by writing r in here and i'm supplying that value of t in here okay by passing this okay uh, where is it here this one integer dot class okay any questions here difference between generic classes and generic methods uh, sir yeah, in sir. print in yeah, print yeah, yeah. to oh ah. print to yes uh, print to dot java class yeah here in this class r that is already predefined class so that is uh, this this class Oh, yes, that class. Ah, this is this is a predefined, right? This comes okay. from Java, okay. Okay. And and look at the uh, argument that you're passing here. You're not passing one, two, three here. You're mm. passing something dot class. Yeah. Okay. The class is based. This class here is basically a wrapper class, you can say. Okay. 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 Mm. Any questions here? Clear, sir. Clear. So we have learned. Uh, what did we learn here? We learned. This is done. This is done. Okay. Let's take a five, ten minutes break. Uh, like, let's just take a six minutes break, and then we'll come back. Okay. Google countdown. If you have, if anyone has any question, you can drop me now. Let's take a five minutes break and come back. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in this entire course, like uh, we are going through the entire curriculum, like are we going through J unit testing and these things or how to? No. So you will have something called level up sessions. Okay. Oh. Mm, I think in those level up sessions, you will have unit testing and all that because uh, unit testing is uh, like it's something that will make sense to someone who has one or two years of experience in the industry. For a fresher, I'm not sure how much important that will be, but because we have people here who are largely freshers, that has been kept aside. Like you will have level up sessions where they will basically talk about microservices, and that's when your unit testing comes in. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. And uh, yesterday in the curriculum, I saw some SQL thing there. Ah, uh -huh. so that's what. So we, we will, yeah. Uh, uh, this Hibernate things here, sir. Yeah, yeah, we have. Uh, I don't know if they have shared the curriculum with you or not. Uh, um, but, uh, the curriculum is not being shared, but if any link can you give to me, I, you, I want to... you can you can see this right. Uh, well, let me check. Uh, there is this thing right in the wiki. No, not was it in wiki? Uh, class, uh, class schedule. You can see this right. You have these. But yeah, if you want to get a glimpse of all the entire curricular, check with uh, this guy, Karan. Okay. okay, because I am not allowed to uh, give you directly on this. He's the one who will coordinate all of these things. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. Got it.
two more minutes and then we'll start. Hello. Sir, you are speaking something? No, not yet, not yet, not yet. <clears throat> okay, so this was our generics. Uh, next thing we'll learn is um, collections, okay? Okay, all right, so what is a collection? I'll actually close everything about these things. And as you start working with collections, you'll know why I taught you generics before. Okay. So let's open up this class. Again, if you're on uh, IntelliJ ID, just go ahead, double shift, uh, include non project items, and then just type collection. Okay. You'll see that it comes from Java util. Click on this and let's see what this is. So collection, you can see here, it is it is basically an interface which is coming from iterable okay iterable is an interface with just a method called iterator so what exactly is collection altogether collection is uh it's a single unit consisting of elements of the same type okay what do i mean by that if you have a collection of strings then that collection will only have strings if you create a collection of integers it will only have integers and those like like you know uh, using the same class for like using the same collection class for creating a collection for strings uh, using the same collection class for creating a collection for integer those things are basically uh made possible by using generics. If you look at iterable here, right, it is basically of type T. This means T extends object. Anything you dump in here, it'll accept it, okay? So this is basically a collection of objects. 
okay this is the widest scope possible okay um similarly collection basically uh, extends from uh, from this thing in fact you know instead of showing you this thing let me actually show you this um maybe a pictorial would be good java t point okay look at this uh, design here okay iterable is basically an interface as we saw okay here and it's a generic interface that that means you can use the same class for any kind of data st structure you have okay then you have uh, collection okay uh, there is something uh, i mean this class does something then this class basically adds some functionalities on top of this then you have basically three types of major collections you have list you have queue you have set we mostly work with list here and set here okay majorly list so the focus will be on list here and then uh, we'll move to set we won't go into queue and everything if you want to learn about queues and everything you can do it later okay so as you can see collection is ex like you have three more interfaces extending this collection this guy adds a little more functionalities uh, from this guy this guy adds a little more than this guy this guy adds a little more than this guy okay um, if you look at the collection interface method here you have these methods add add all remove remove all remove retain all size clear and each of these functions do a few things different okay if you see here add is the uh, function that adds the element add all means you can pass a collection again like if you have a list and you want to add more items to that list you can run a loop and you can add one by one by one or you can just add them all together we'll go through an example to see what it does then you have remove you can remove a particular object you can remove all of them uh, remove if and like you have many things out here size basically tells you what size you have clear will remove all the elements that you have okay so we'll use these methods so the first thing that we are going to work with here is list okay list as you see here is essentially just an uh it's an extension of collection here okay so what is the difference between this guy this guy and this guy the difference is that collection here provides you these functionalities right add add all and all of these things each of these basically define how the element is going to be added for example think about this array list here okay array list is going to basically use an array so when you add something to that list it is going to keep adding to an array okay in the array list if you use retrieval of an object like if you say that give me an item at the index let's say five that retrieval is very quick because you have the index in the array it will go to the fifth index and it will fetch the element that is not the case with linked list though linked list here is uh, something that like in array list you have the constraint of uh, basically like when you initialize an array you have to uh, have a fixed set of memory right linked list does not have that linked list you can keep on adding nodes to it so these are basically uh, you know how they're different from this Q here is different altogether. Like uh, Q implements things differently. Uh, set also implements things differently. So based on the functionality, they have separated out three things here. Okay. So let's talk about the list here. Uh, let's actually go to the list class here. You can see in this, you have size is empty, contains iterator to array. All of these things are there. Add contains all all of these things. Okay. Uh, then if you click on this icon here you can see you have all of these things abstract list so basically these will give you what all classes uh oh my god the list is so big it it's hanging up here okay we go to abstract list okay abstract list you can see that it this uh generic here has been passed it, it, if you look at something if you notice something interesting right you will see that this e here right this E here is basically uh, a, a generic element, okay? And it has been passed down all the way to the implementing class here, okay? So this guy, abstract list, whoever initializes this abstract list will pass this E value, which will then go into list value here. Uh, yeah, so list is basically an interface which extends collection. That E will be passed to your collection here. 
and that e from collection will be passed to your iterable layer. This is how you can create or you can extend a generic class, but you would have to make sure that you keep passing the generic all the way to the parent class. Okay. So uh, we'll work with list. Okay. Specifically array list. Let's create a um, list main. Okay. This is the class where we are going to deal only with the list function. Okay. Um, so this list here, uh, generic, it basically says, what do you want this list to have? Do you want it to have string? Do you want it to have integer or something? For now, we'll just say string. Okay. So we'll create something called list. Now, this is an interface, right? List is an interface. If you click on this, you can see that list here is an interface. Now list is implemented by few classes. If you come here back to this diagram, you can see that list is actually implemented by these uh, three classes, uh, array and linked list. Vector is again an abstract class, which is implemented by stack. Okay, we'll just deal with these two things here. So we'll use array list. Okay, in this, you can do two things you can ideally set an initial capacity of it or you can give it uh, no capacity or you can basically pass another collection to it okay uh, notice something here it says collection this uh, question mark extend string okay what that basically means is that because we initialize this list to be a string you can either uh, put an initial capacity like you can either say five or if you leave blank, it'll take whatever default value is there, or you can pass an entire list to it altogether. So when you're creating this list, you can create it along with another list. Okay, we'll see that. For now, we'll just leave it blank. And uh, simplest way to add is list.add. And then you basically add whatever string you have. Okay, let me just go ahead adding. This is very simple. Like there's nothing jargonic about this. And then if you want to print this thing, just go ahead and print the list here. And that's it. You'll see this long string here. And this is how the list is actually represented. Okay. This comma separated values. And uh, yeah, uh, you can also use, uh, let's say I want to remove something. Okay. Let's say list dot remove. Okay. There are many ways to remove it. Uh, you can remove an entire collection itself. You can remove a particular object or you can remove something from a particular index. Okay. Uh, we'll go with the index one or, you know, just to make things easy, I'll put a here. I'll put B here. I'll put C here. I'll put D here. Okay. If I say remove, let's say I go by the index and I say remove from the second one. Okay, so this is your zero, this is your one, this is your two. So C should be gone. Okay. C has been removed. Uh, let me see if this works without this. Like if I just pass C to it, list dot remove. Because string is mutable, I don't think it will be able to remove this. Yeah, it removed. Okay, so it removed C here. Uh, yeah, so this is basically the remove function. If you want to see the size of it, like um you can just see uh size list dot size okay you have size three because currently there are three elements okay so that's mostly what you will be using list for like just to add elements to remove elements and all that and uh one important thing to tell you here is if you are creating a method which is going to return a list, never return the concrete type, always return the interface type. Okay, what do I mean by that? 
uh, let's say I have a I'm going to return a list of integers here. Okay. Actually, let's remove this. Let's keep it blank for now. Mm, convert to list. Okay. This is my method here. This method will take a, let's say an array of integers. Okay. Integers. My job here is to convert this integers into uh, a list. Okay. So if somebody passes me an integers array, they'll get a list back. So in, I could I could have done this array list dot integer. I could have done that, but why am I not doing this? Because tomorrow, if they come up with something, let's say uh, array list two, which is much much faster, I won't be able to do anything here. Okay, because then I will have to if I want to change it, I'll have to go ahead and change the. Data. I'll show you what the problem is with this thing. Okay, let let me just work with this for now. So uh, let's say I create this array list, okay, of integer, integer array list, new array list, okay. Simple thing. Uh, you guys probably don't know about uh, stream API, so I'll just use simple for loop, okay. I'll actually use for each loop. So I, I'll say uh, integer array list dot add if anyone has any problem with for each loop let me know stop me right now and i'll tell you what it does what is it uh, replace iteration with bulk collection error call never mind huh so that's it and we will return ignore the yellow line for now uh integer array list okay so let's say you have a main method here this is my main method okay let me get rid of this So I want to use this. So what I'm going to do is I'll say list main, list main, uh, new list main. Okay. Uh, I will also have an integer array. Let's say zero, five, six, seven, like this. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll basically try to display what this does. So I'll I'll say list main dot convert to list. I'll pass the array to it. Okay. Run this. You can see this is working just fine, right? Now let's say there is an imaginary array list to class. Okay. Somebody has come up with a faster array list or something. Or let's say you figured out that linked list is faster than this. Now, if you want to return a linked list, you will have to change it here. Okay. You will have to change it here. You will have to also change it in your calling method. Okay. You see the problem, right? Because now, I mean, this is just one method and you have like few instances of this array list. If you had a method of let's say 60 70 lines or if you had 10 such methods where everywhere you used array list changing it to linked list would be an extremely difficult task which is why in the software industry there is a concept called programming to interface okay what it basically says is that keep using the interface until there is a point where you cannot use interface at all and you have to use a con concrete class, okay? Which means that in this place, instead of returning the array list, if I just do a list dot integer, okay? Then here, instead of array list, I can just change it and, and also here, I guess. Yeah. If I do this, then here, instead of array list, I can just replace it with linked list and it will work just as fine nothing would change okay did you understand why i did this tomorrow if there is something else like there is i think stack right if you do stack here you don't have to make changes in many places your method signature remains the same everything remains the same okay any questions so far as to why we program with the interface so this is basically what list functionality does uh, I'll tell you a basic uh, 
working difference between uh, array list and linked list because this could be a interview question in many places okay all right so let's see let's say i have this array okay 0 1 2 3 4 um yeah 4 okay all right so how the array list and linked list work is um if you have this array and you want to settle it or you want to save it using uh, let's say array list array list because underneath it implements an array you know that you cannot have an array implementation without mentioning the size what do i mean by that um, you cannot if you say int arr right you have to give a size here otherwise it will throw you it will it will not allow you to do this array initializer exception you can just say 3 here or you could say five here, but you have to have something, okay? This is the thing about Java. When you initialize an array, you have to give the capacity of it, okay? What that means is that in this case, um, I told you, right, there are many ways to basically uh, initialize an array list. Let's say we give an initial capacity of five, okay? which means that in the memory, it will occupy five such blocks. Okay, five such blocks. You insert zero here, it is. it goes in. You insert one here, it goes in. You insert two here, it goes in. The moment you insert three here, there's something called load factor, okay? What the load factor does is it recognizes that the list is about to be full. So what it does is that it at, at the insertion of this element, it basically takes the entire size. It says, okay, there are five elements. So it will be replaced by double the size. Did you see what happened here? Array list, basically when you're working with array list, if you initialize it with a particular size, it will keep filling it and it will basically uh, like the moment you initialize it with something like this, like five or something, right? There is a mechanism which will identify what is the 75% of this five. Okay. So the moment you enter the 75% of it, like, like the moment the list is 75% full, it will basically readjust itself. It will discard this array. It will create another array of double the size okay and it will gradually insert all the elements here problem with this is if you see it can go on expanding forever like here and then here okay what is the issue with this thing let's say your array is full let's say your array is full up to this part okay four five Let's say this is the 75 percent of the array so the moment you enter six here it will go ahead and it will readjust itself creating another uh, array and it will discard this one and internally it will create another array with double the size okay problem with this is let's say you enter just one more element here okay and then you don't use anything at all this much of memory will be waiting for you to be used, but you won't be inserting anything. You won't be accessing it, which means this is a wasted memory. Okay. This is the problem with array list as your data grows large, as your data becomes very huge. I mean, not even very huge. Like if you have an array of 1 million such blocks, and then you enter the 1 million and one element, it will immediately readjust itself to 2 million you probably won't even need the 2 million data, okay? But it will still sit there occupying RAM. This is a problem with array list. This is the reason why linked list came into picture. What are the advantages of array list? Accessing the element is extremely simple. You mention the index, it will go there and read the element and give it come, you know, come back to you. If you are familiar with data structures, time complexity, you would know that accessing an element reading from an array is always O of one. Okay, insertion also is most of the time O of one because you just insert into one element. In cases like this, when you reach the 75% of the list, 
then your operation becomes O of n. Okay, not O of n. Basically, it becomes whatever your size is at that point. Okay. Um, yeah. So th this is a major problem with array list. And if you're if you are building some application, like if you ever do Android uh, app development, right? Uh, there you will their memory is a constraint. So you would have to be very careful as to with what data structure you use. Problem with I mean this is what linked list does. Linked list basically creates node. Every time you insert an element, it creates a node. Okay. Let's say you have five elements. It will go ahead and create five nodes. The moment you insert one more element, it will create one more node. Okay. So your memory is not really wasted. Whatever element, whatever number of elements you're using, your memory remains there. Okay. The problem, the problem is accessing is very difficult. If you say, find me the third element. It will come here. It will go from here to here. It will go from here to here. It will go from here to here, and then it will get you the element on the third index, okay? Which is the fourth element. So, insertion also insertion in most of these cases is O of one because you're inserting at the end of it. But retrieval becomes O of n because if you are trying to retrieve the last element, the nth element, it will go through all the nodes to reach the last element, and then it will do it. So. If you have a question like this as to what you are going to use, what data structure, what list you are going to use, always give them the answer that it depends on the scenario. Okay. If we are having a memory constraint, then we would probably go with linked list. Okay. Any questions here so far? Cool. All right. So that was basically uh, introduction to list and array list. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, which, which. Sir, when they ask regarding the differences between the array list and the list, so huh. the major difference is only this thing, right? This is the major difference. Memory constraint is the major difference. Memory constraint, and when you're trying to access the element, okay. linked list. Linked list is this. Like linked list will not occupy a lot of memory. Maybe if you have like two or three elements, linked list will take a lot of memory because ideally, in uh, what happens is everything. The Java code, I don't know if you know this or not, but when you're running the Java byte code, it be basically becomes C code. Okay. So there you need to store a pointer to the next node, right? So this much yes. space is actually taken. But uh, if you have like huge number of elements, you would, you would be more inclined to use this because this is a bad practice. Okay. Uh, the expansion of array list always happens like this. It doubles the size. Okay. And retrieval time is also O of one here. It could be O of n here. Okay. Sure. Cool. Uh, we'll move to what is next. Let's get rid of this. We'll move to uh, basically set. Okay. Set is also uh, something very similar. You can see here set also has all of the functionalities that this has and there are different ways in which uh, set basically stores the elements. Okay. Uh, you have hash set and then you have linked hash set. Okay. So if you guys are familiar with uh, the concept of hashing or hash map or anything like that, then this would be easy for you. But if it's not, let me explain what it is. Okay. So in set, Acha, before that, let me show you how set is actually used. Okay. Uh, let me get rid of this. Let me create a set main. Okay. Uh, set main, just a main method. Okay. How do you create set? You would say final set. Okay. It will, again, it's a generic type. So it will ask you what type of data you want this set to be. I'll say this is just integer. Okay. So set, and then it will basically tell you what type of, uh, like, what is the implementation set is basically an interface. What is the implementation you want? You could say it, it is hash set or tree set or linked hash set. Okay. There are many different sets. We'll mostly deal with hash set and tree set. Okay. So for now, I'll just be using hash set. Okay. All right. And uh, things are very simple here, like set add, add, you can add an element here. Mm. Uh, you can see that they're giving a warning here. What is that warning here? They're saying duplicate element. Okay. I'll come to this, why they're saying duplicate elements. Two, 
three, four, okay. And then you just say uh, set, just print the set. You can see it, it has the exact same representation of this, okay. Uh, it works exactly like how a list would work. I mean, the working is different, but the methods are exactly the same. So if you come here and say remove, you can see that you can have this uh, ah, achha, uh, important thing to note here. Okay. You see that set only has remove, remove all and, you know, remove all using collection and retain all. Okay. You basically have these two methods, but in list here, when we were trying this out, uh, where is it? It's a major list. Remove had a few more methods, remove by index and everything. When you inspect this, you can see that it actually comes from, this comes from your collection class, but this index wala part, this actually comes from the list interface. So I told you, right, in the beginning that collection has a few methods, list adds something little more than collections, and then these guys basically implement it. In the set here, we do not see this list remove, I mean, remove by index method, because that is not the original method of the collection, okay? I just wanted to point this out. Okay, uh, yeah. So here you can just see all of these things. And if you want to remove something, uh, you just have to pass that object. Like, let's say I want to remove five here, okay? There is no five, but let's see what it does. It will probably not complain about it. Huh, it's the same thing because there was no five. Remove two. Cool. All right. So what is a hash set and how does a hash set work internally? Let's talk about that. The concept of hashing is that if you are given some value, right, you basically insert it into a hash function. This hash function generates a, a key. Okay. This is what it does. In a hash set, in a regular hash set, they implement using array. Okay. So if you do not specify a limit to it, they will automatically create a bunch of like uh, they will create they, they will have a default size okay and what happens is um, okay before I do this let me also explain the concept of bucket to you okay what is a bucket a bucket is essentially just an um, Wait, do I need to explain the bucket to you? No, the bucket is because we're explaining hash set, right? Don't worry about the bucket at this point, okay? Let's just focus on this. What happens here is when you, uh, let's say uh, in my example, I was passing just one, right? What this does is the hash function is basically going to take this input, okay? It will basically take this input. It will give you uh, let's say some key, okay? And this key will essentially just be the index of the array. Okay, what do I mean by this? You will insert a value. This hash function will basically digest this element and it will give you an index of the key. Okay, let's say if, if for in our case, it gives you two, which means that in the twoth position, you will find one here. Okay. Uh, if you, let's say, insert two here, the hash function, let's say, gives you the index zero, which means on the zeroth element, you will have two here. This is basically how the hashing function works. Now, there are different types of hashing functions, so I won't get into the details of it, but just know that when you're saying add one, right, in behind the scene, what's happening is it is hashing the, with the value and it's spitting out an index number, okay? What happens is when you insert one again into this, like when I do the same thing, the hash function is written in such a way that if you pass the same value to it, 
it will always spit out the same index. Okay, this is basically what a hash function does, which which is why in a hash set basically, which is an impl a hashing implementation of set, a ha in a hash set you will never have duplicates. Okay, you will never have duplicates in this. That's why you get this warning: remove navigate to duplicate, like duplicate set element. Okay. It won't complain. The compiler won't complain. But you can see it. This is an IntelliJ uh, giving you warning that you are trying to do something, which is basically a duplicate. So, if you ever get asked what a hash set does, know this that there is a hashing function which takes in the input, and it spits out basically the index at which it is going to be stored. Okay. Uh, so, given the same input, it will always give out the same index. All right. So, let's see a few things here. If if I want to retrieve something, um, I can just pass the key to retrieve. It will hash it. It will give me the index. It will go here and fetch the object from the index itself. Let's say if I want to remove this particular object, what it will do is it will go, it will hash it, it will find out the index, it will come here, and it will basically free up the memory here. And then it will be blank. Okay. This is how hash set works. But like uh, array list, hash set also runs into the same problem that if the 75% of this is filled up, it will go ahead and keep a double of this memory. Okay. This is why, this is the reason why you have another uh, thing here called linked hash set, which is basically the linked list implementation of this uh, set function. Okay. Any questions about this? What the hash set does? If, if anyone asks you how uh, it is preventing duplicate functionality, you can say that given the same input, the hashing function will always give out the same index. So if you if you insert 100 times, it will always go into the same uh, index and it will always re just replace the value. Okay. Any questions about hash set? Cool. Okay. They have missed out something here, which is basically tree set. Okay. And tree set is something where, uh, okay, so how do I explain this to you? In a hash set, if you use a typical hash set, right, the ordering is never guaranteed. As in, if you insert one, two, three, four, and if you try to remove, let's say, set dot uh, get, where is it? Uh, huh, yes. So uh, remember I told you that collection has uh, a parent class called iterator, okay? It basically gives you something with through which you can basically run a loop, okay? So even if you don't do that, if you run a for each loop here, right? Uh, let's say int i this set, okay? I. If you run this uh, thing here, right? There is no guarantee that it will always print one, two, three, four in the exact order in which this has been inserted. There is no guarantee of that. Why is there no guarantee? Because in the array, they do a lot of optimization there. And basically when you're reading the values out of here, they will always basically uh, like for some optimization reason, they can give you this element before that because in the memory, right? They don't always uh, allocate the memory side by side. Okay, the allocation is very sparse, as in, if they have taken out, let's say, uh, how do I explain this to you? Let's say your Java program, okay, your Java program is running, and it needs basically three blocks, okay? So this is where you're in the memory, your Java program will take these two blocks, then let's say there is another C program running, it has taken two blocks, but you have one more Java, uh, I mean, your program java program requires one more block it will take this memory block okay so the ordering is never there okay uh, i mean this is like at the os level right the memory allocation is sparsely done okay in in your ram this this much memory is probably taken up by java this much memory is taken up by c and then again you have this much taken up by java so that's why in the hash set function you cannot guarantee the ordering in most of the cases you will have uh, you know uh, the elements printed out in the exact order in which you insert but it's not guaranteed in order to 
basically maintain the uh, i mean in order to guarantee the order of insertion we have something called tree set okay this is how it is done um set okay actually i can just before you know um just bring this thing let me why don't i just go ahead and actually show you what happens here see what happens if I run this. Okay, yeah, this is a good example. I inserted one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, when it printed the first time, it said it had one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, then I removed two here, so this got removed. But look at this. When I am basically printing this out, right? One, three, four, five, six is. Oh, okay. What? Hmm, okay. Never mind. Okay. So this ordering is still maintained there, but basically in a hash set, the ordering is not guaranteed. That is the reason why we have maybe like if I run this thing like a five, six times, then the order will mess up. Never mind. Let's talk about tree set. Okay. Uh, tree set. Tree set is exactly like how set is. It's just that the ordering is always maintained there. Um, give me one second, huh? iterator. This is the set iterator. Yeah. Mm, let, can, let me just check. Thing. Iterator. I can I not print I here? Let me get rid of this. Let me get rid of this. Acha, no, I cannot print it like this. Uh, this needs to have four. Um, not four. While iterator has next basically uh, iterator dot get next huh let's see well look can we enhance the for loop uh, fine never mind i don't know they're just integrating this let me just let me just run this okay never mind the ordering is maintained here Never mind. Uh, let's just work with uh, tree set. I'm not sure why the ordering is still maintained, but usually uh, the ordering is never guaranteed in a set. That's why you have something called tree set. Tree set basically uh, maintains the exact order in which the insertion happened. Um, achha, let me just do this. I think I got something slightly wrong. One, three, four, acha. Ha, huh, correct, correct. Okay, let me rephrase myself, okay? I made a mistake here. So in the set, okay, so far, whatever we have seen here, uh, the order in which you insert the element, it will always be displayed to you in the exact same order. How is that being done? Because they're using basically uh, the array here. And if you're not using that, if you're using linked hash set, even then one node is linked up to another node. Okay. So the order in which you insert the element, it will be the same thing. Like you'll get the order in the same way. But what if you want to have a set where like after insertion, when you want the elements coming out, you want them in the let's say uh, ascending order. Like I have inserted here one, two, three, five, six, and four. But when I want to read the values here, I want one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. In here, you can see that one, two, three. What the? One second. Huh? 
Hmm. Okay. Then how does tree set work? Let me just check. Add, let's say two. Okay. Uh, three, five, one. If I do it like this, and then I do a tree set, what happens here? Am I, oh, in this case, one, two, three, five, acha. Hmm. Even though I have inserted the elements, like if I get rid of this iterator part completely, what's the difference between this and that? Uh, right, okay, okay, cool. One, three, four, huh, okay. Okay, so what is the difference between set and tree set, okay? Uh, if you see here, I am inserting one, two, three, five, six, and four. So when you're basically printing the array here, I'm sorry, printing the set here, you get one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Uh, then okay, um, that's weird. Okay, I'll have to look into this thing. This I'll be explaining in the next class. I have to see why this is not happening. This is not working out. Okay. So uh, forget about the tree set for now. We'll look at this later in the next class. But this is how the set basically works. Okay. Uh, you insert elements into it and it's the hash set. You cannot, uh, the good thing about hash set is that you will not be able to insert. Sir. Yeah. Sir, actually, uh, normal hash set, the insertion order is not preserved. Hmm. Okay. And linked hash set, the insertion order is preserved. Whereas tree set uh, prints the elements, I mean, stores the element in the, I mean, ascending order. Hmm. But actually, uh, the you know, the result, what we are getting, we can say that it is a coincidence. You just right, comment right. line number 21. Comment line number 21, you 21. say this one? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Now print. Because as far as I know, tree set is the one that maintains the order. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, ah, one, but two, we three. are inserting one, two, five, three. What we are inserting? One, two, one, five, two, three, five again. Uh, don't worry about this. Yes. One. This is just a duplicate. Yes. Word. We are inserting one, two, five, three, ah. six, four, right? Right. But we are getting one, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, so the ordering is being done uh, there. It's yeah, a, random, it's random ordering is there. Ah. Whereas uh, you use linked hash set, sir. No, I use just hash set. Okay. If you if you use linked hash set, then insertion order will be preserved. Correct. Linked hash set will pr preserve the insertion order. Linked hash. But yes. the, I think I think in the the difference between tree set and the set is that you would have to have. Uh, acha, I think you can have duplicate elements in tree set. Let me just check once. Uh, is that possible? No. No, sir. It is not possible. Hmm. Okay. There's something about the uh, ordering, I guess. I'll check back and like. Reset will automatically increasing order. But uh, uh, for example, uh, can you go to line number uh, maybe 20? Ah, huh, line number 20, yes. Uske upar aur jaiye, sir, zara. Uh, huh. You create one more, uh, I mean, uh, set uh, uh -huh. and th that is linked hash set with the same elements. Achha, what achha. you have inserted in uh -huh, hash set. Uh -huh. Then we can, uh, we can find the difference. Theek hai. Okay, let, let me do this here. Uh, set integer uh, L set okay new linked hash set and let's just add this copy paste we copy paste it there Neto, sir we have one method now L set dot add all add all wala ha add all wala kar sakte hain ha add all method use kar add all isme wahi collection chahiye are set set de denge is me wo set dal denge ha ha set set dal sakte theek hai correct ye niche ka remove kar dijiye let's print now print link that set l set now we can see hope it's the same thing same thing but we can say that actually 
हाँ सो दिस इज दोइंसिडेंटल लाइक आई नो द ऑर्डरिंग बट ये दिखा नहीं रहा है यहाँ पे बेसिकली हाँ वही है बेसिकली दिस थ्री आर लाइक Uh, for hash set insertion order will not be preserved for correct, linked correct. hash set insertion order will be preserved, will be preserved. for reset the elements ah. will be stored in sorted manner correct 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 that's that's basically the difference between yes. uh, set i mean hash set linked hash set and tree set okay. yes sir uh yep that's there and yeah that is all about set any questions anyone Cool. We'll quickly go over the last uh, class that we have here, which is map. It's a, a map is basically uh, a key-value pair. So you will have a key and a value. Okay. I'll show a very quick example of this. Map. Sir, sir, one who oh, had a set. Me, a uh, doubt tha, sir. Ha ha. So actually, jo I mean arrangement hai, jo random arrangement rata. Wo kaisa karta sir internally? Kaun sa random arrangement? In uh, hash set we'll have random arrangement, right? हाँ 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 तो इसमें क्या होता है ना basically the documentation correct correct वो कैसा करता है सर random arrangement uh, so basically जो तुम values में pass करते हो वो hash function से इसका अलग सा hash function है मतलब different uh, मतलब implementation का different hashing function है but basically okay. क्या होता है कि ये एक तुमको एक index spit out करते हैं वो random होता है ठीक okay. है तो तुम अगर तुम one insert कर रहे हो तो वो two पे जा के रहेगा अगर तुम टू इन मतलब सॉरी वन इंसर्ट करो तो वो टू एथ इंडेक्स में जाके बैठेगा ठीक है इफ यू आर इंसर्टिंग टू इट कुड सिट इन द जीरो and in the tree set they uh, usually maintain the uh, like you, you can go ahead and read the documentation of the tree set they maintain the ordering out there okay sir cool uh then we will quickly learn about map okay you i'll take you through the map interface map is actually not part of collection map is a separate interface altogether it's basically a key value pair you can see here that this is also uh, having a generic uh, th there is k here and v here k represents key v represents value they have the same thing size is empty which is boolean which will tell you whether it's empty or not contains key uh, contains value in most cases we are going to use only hash map okay uh, how do i do that final map string integer okay uh this the map hash map okay and you could just add you have the first method is put okay put here uh you will be giving some name like let's say a here one here okay um map dot put b here Two here, okay. This is just a key value pair. You can uh, either use put here, or you can like, uh, yeah, put if you're putting it for the first time. Let's say you want to replace some value, okay. So there are two ways of doing this thing. You can either say map dot put, okay, uh, where you can say a equals three, okay. You can either do that, or there is a more specific method called replace. Okay, in this replace, you can just say a equals three, and then that will basically go ahead and replace this thing. So uh, this is what, uh, and and you have a few more methods like you can say remove. Uh, you have this thing, uh, get. Okay, in get here, you basically have to give the key here. For example, I want to print the object at, I mean the value at a. So I'll just say this out. Right, and I want to see what the map holds and up until this point. So I'll just print the map, okay? Ah, you can see this is how a map is represented: key-value, key-value pair, and the element at 
uh, a is three because even though we inserted one here, we replaced it with the value of this. Okay, and then you have a function which basically checks if some element is there or not. So you can say contains key. Okay, contains key. You can pass the element a. It will return true because a is there. If I give let's say c here. It will give false. Okay. Um, similarly, you can just uh, check if a particular value is present or not. Okay. There are many uh, different methods that we will uh, see when we start using map. But let's talk about how a map is implemented. I'll take just five minutes of yours. So pay attention here because uh, there is a concept of bucket in map. Okay. All right. So let's see how a map basically works. Say I want to insert. Uh, sir, it's 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 very important, sir. Internal uh, working of hash map. Yeah. Because uh, in uh, Enquiry Global, uh -huh. for the two rounds also, uh, the technical people asked explain the internal working yes. of hash map. Yes, yes, yes. So it's a it's a very important concept, and yes, basically sir. based on uh, like they sometimes they will ask you to implement your own hash map own map with own functionalities and everything and they'll tell you how to retrieve an element in o of n time so those things are like that's not the scope of this uh, course here but i'll just introduce you to the basics of how things work let's say this is what my this is what i want to basically insert in my map okay So the map essentially is um, internally, it, it is a key value pair, right? But uh, understand what happens. Let's say I'm trying to insert A here, okay? Hash map will pass A through a hash function, okay? This will give you a particular index. Let's say it gives you, um, let's say first index. So if we can imagine an array like this, okay, um, this value, it gives you the index of one. So it will come here and it will place A here, okay? Then you do the same thing for let's say B. Because your key is B here, Let's say it gives you a random of three. Okay. So, you know, zero, one, two, three, at this point, you would have your, uh, sorry, uh, we'll actually put this value. Uh, A is one, B is two. Okay. All right. So on the zero, one, two, three, this is where it's set. Now, let's say you pass C here. And there is a possibility that it gives you the same index. Okay. The hashing function, even though they are meant to make things unique, there is always a possibility that the hash function, and it's a very slim possibility, but there's always the possibility that the same hash function can give you like for a different output, right? You can see here, uh, sorry, for a different input, like B here gave three here. There's a possibility that another key, a different key can also give you the same index number. Because if you, if you look into the hash function, I'm not gonna go into the details of it. If you look into the hash function, you have basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You have an array of nine blocks. Okay. And you're trying to insert 10 elements in there. There will be a collision. There will be one key for which uh, one index would overlap. So let's say, let's take C for example. Okay. We have inserted, let's say lots of elements here. Okay. And then C is that one element, which is overflowing the, this thing, the size of the array here. C will give you three. Now, when you come to three here, you see that three already has a value two. I mean, this is a, this is a value of B. 
but c here has a 4 so how what do you do do you replace it if you replace it with 4 then your 2 is lost right you need to find a way to basically keep both the values okay this is where the concept of bucket comes in okay what is a bucket a bucket is a, is a memory allocation where you can insert n number of elements okay in the simplest sense a bucket is nothing but do you guys recognize what this is it is nothing but a linked list so let me show you how this is done okay um actually uh, i think it would be good if i could draw it out to you okay web whiteboard Imagine this as the index of the array, okay? Okay. This is your zeroth array, the zeroth index, first index, second index, third index, okay? You have A coming in, A, it says that put uh, the value of A in one, okay? So you go ahead and put one here, okay? Cool. You put one here. Then your B comes here and it goes to three, okay? So you put the value of B here, which is two, okay? Okay. Now when C comes, C is also colliding. So C will have to be kept here. The C's value is coming to this particular index. What do you do here? In, in a case like this, you basically start a linked list, okay? And it looks something like this. Okay? This basically keeps two information here. Let me get rid of this. Let me get rid of this. So because there is a collision here, you now have a problem, right? You have a two here and then you have a four here. You have to keep both of them. What happens is this guy is essentially just a bucket. I mean, it's essentially just a node of linked list. Um, what it does is it says for B, there is a two placed here. Okay. When you have a C coming here, This is what a bucket is called, okay? This is how a hash map is internally implemented, okay? So every element that you see here, including this one here, will basically have a linked list node attached to it. This is how a map is in real life implemented. Any questions here? Let's see how uh, this thing works, okay? You insert A, it gives you a hash, and it says put the value of A in first index. It comes to first index, and it creates a link. There is nothing there, so it creates a linked list node, and it basically inserts the key and the value there, okay? Uh, then it goes ahead and it hashes B, it gives three. So it comes to the third index and it keeps B and two here with a linked list. Then when there is a collision here, it will basically append one more node. It knows that it, the value has to be sitting in the third index, right? So it will go here. It will go through all the nodes in the linked list. It will find out the last node and then it will basically go ahead and add the value there. Okay. Is this clear? Because this is how an insertion operation, this is what an insertion operation in map does. If you do not have uh, 
uh, if, you, if you do not have a linked list there, it will go ahead and create a linked list for you. And then you'll basically, uh, it will keep in certain values there. Okay. So this entire thing, this is called a bucket. And in a map, in every index, there is a bucket there. Okay. A bucket is nothing, just a linked list. Now, for optimization, they can implement maybe a doubly linked list for, it's mostly implemented using a doubly linked list so that you can go in bi-directional way. But this is how an insertion, this is how a map is actually structured. Any questions so far? Does anyone want me to explain this again? Okay, so I would assume that everyone has got a clear understanding of this. Now, in a hash map, retrieval is almost always O of one, okay? Because in most cases, what ha the hashing function is so perfect. I mean, it's not perfect. The hashing function is written in such a way that most of the time it, there would not be a collision. But if there is a collision, then this is how it goes. So when somebody asks you, what is the time complexity of a hash map? You can say that in most cases it is O of one. Yeah, Abhishek, you have a question? By chat me likho tumar awaz ekdam nahi aa rahe chat me lik do apna question chat me lik do sunai nahi de raha ekdam theek one word ha ha so uh, what happens is uh, in most cases the retrieval is the get operation will always be o of 1 because it it is written in that way but if there is a collision, like if you have an element for which there are there is a bucket and the bucket has two or three nodes in the linked list, then your retrieval becomes O of n. Okay, this is a very important factor that you have to remember. This is how a map is uh, a hash map specifically is implemented. Okay, if you have any questions, let me know. Huh? Yeah. If the indexes uh, they are in like in a, how many arrays the index are in one after the another in a sequential address uh, these are also in sequential address or they can be stored anywhere uh sequential addresses like, like uh, one not one one not two in arrays one not one one not two one not two, like some address it will be stored continuously uh -huh. no 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 so in the so in your uh, in your os in your operating system it is not guaranteed that they will be in mean, sequential blocks I told you in this, was that your question? I told oh, you yes, right? yes, in the yeah. operating system, right? So what is, uh, what is your Java application? Java application basically runs on a JVM. You never really directly talk to the OS. You write Java code, which is then translated to bytecode, which is then actually understood by your system. So you're never talking to the actual machine. You're talking to a Java virtual machine. Okay. In the virtual machine, you can have contiguous blocks. You can have one, two, three separately, but they can all link to like in the actual OS implementation, they may not be together. Like you can see here, right? This Java application requires three memory blocks. It is highly possible that the first two blocks are occupied by Java block. The next by a C program, the next one by a Java program. This is how at the OS level, this thing happens. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. That's cool. Any more questions? Guys, let me know if you have any problem understanding some concept, like I might not be good at explaining something. I'll try to explain again. Okay. Cool. If there are no more questions, I'll end the session today. Thank you all for joining. And uh, I think uh, if you have any queries regarding the, I, there is an assignment regarding this too, but I think he has not prepared the assignment sheet. So once he prepares the assignment sheet, uh, it will be there in the Avenger sheet as well. You can key, uh, check if you have any problems or any queries regarding the assignment, come back to me and I'll, he I'll help you out. Okay. I don't know everyone to uh, know everything. So you know, you're free to come to me and ask questions. All right. I'll close the session. Thank you very much.